God willing, our studies on uh, Malachi will endeavour to uh, relate to the affairs of Israel in their day, but we also want to equate them with our own hope of Israel and our own walk in the kingdom of God today. So our studies around Malachi are to be upon the theme of which comes from uh, chapter 3 and at verse um, 2, who may abide the day of his coming? And this is the dominant theme that we find permeates throughout the book of Malachi. So during the course of these studies, we're going to hopefully draw attention to some of the major highlights of the exhortational aspects of the ministry of Malachi, At the same time, we're going to endeavour to try and see how the message of God in every age and every generation is applicable to every age and to every generation. And Malachi being the last prophecy of the Old Testament is particularly, particularly applicable to our day. Now, to make a thorough study of the book of Malachi, when I've even though I've looked at it in the past, I looked and thought, yeah, four or five studies would be fine. But to, to do it justice, you'd need to do 12, 14, maybe more Bible classes, really. But since I don't have that many, we're going to just deal with the book as best we can. We're going to touch upon most of the verses, but some verses, various verses throughout the book, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on in more depth. And hopefully we can draw from it the highlights as we see them, and we can understand the message Malachi is giving, but we need to understand it particularly in reality for us today. So keep your finger in Malachi, and just come over with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 and at verse 12. We know these words well, they're quoted quite often. In Hebrews 4 and at verse 12 we read, For the word of God is quick and powerful. Now that's the section of that verse we're going to deal with at the moment. For, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that last part of that verse we will deal with in a later study. Tonight we're going to be looking at that first part of the verse. So we're told emphatically here in Hebrews 4 and verse 12 that the word of God is quick and powerful. Now, the words quick and powerful don't really do this verse justice. They're not sufficiently accurate in relation to what they mean. So what's really being said there in Hebrews 4 verse 12 is, as Rotherham renders it, is more correct. For living is the word of God and energetic. And the RSB and NIV and other translations have, for the word of God is living and active. Now that's really, as we go through these studies, and that's what it's become for me, it's become living and active. And it's made me really think about where we are in the truth, where I am in the truth personally, or where we may be as an ecclesia. And that's what Malachi actually has to become for us. It has to become living in our lives, it has to become energetic, and it has to become active. Now, Paul is telling us here in Hebrews that the scriptures become living when, when they're transferred from the page, the written page from scripture, into our minds and into our intellect. And when they become actually part of us. Not just something we might read each day, but they become part of us. When we study them for the lessons that we can gain from the word. When we, when we chew on them as it were in the mental process. When we meditate on the things that we read there and we absorb those lessons that are there for us today. And they become very real things in our lives. You know, the word of God is both living, energetic and active when it actually motivates the transformation of us personally into a character that's pleasing to God and that will be fitted for an inheritance 
in the kingdom of God. So that's what Malachi has to be for us and has to do for us. So who was this fellow Malachi then? Well, the answer is we don't know. Now, there are many authorities, and I've looked at as many um, things written about Malachi as I could. Many authorities would have us believe that Malachi is merely a pseudonym, that Malachi was actually anonymously written. But I don't actually believe that at all, because not based upon the, upon the principle of the consistency of Scripture. So it can't be just anonymously written. It, it, it's written at its time for a clear purpose. Now, Malachi's name actually means um, my messenger or a messenger. And, of course, it's, it Strong says a messenger specifically of God. And, of course, the one whose message Malachi is delivering here is Yahweh Elohim of Israel, the mighty one of heaven. So throughout Malachi's prophecy here, we have no less really than five different messengers of God revealed to us. It's, it's a book of messages from a variety of messengers. In Malachi 1, we have Malachi himself. In Malachi 2, verse 7, we have the priests of Israel. Now, they're referred to in Malachi 2, verse 7. The priests, it says there that in Malachi 2, verse 7, the priests which should keep knowledge. And the people of Israel, it says, they should seek the knowledge at the mouth of the priest. Because the priest is the messenger of Yahweh Sabaoth. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, we have the third messenger presented to us, and that's John the Baptist. The fourth messenger is in Malachi 3 verse 1 also, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God. And the fifth messenger we have is Elijah. Elijah, who is yet to come, he's in, depicted in Malachi 4 verse 5. Now, the period of writing of the book of Malachi is really interesting and of importance to our general understanding of the significance of the times in which he wrote. Now, Malachi was contemporary with Zechariah, um, Haggai, Nehemiah, uh, Ezra, and Esther. And he wrote somewhere around, about, not exactly, but somewhere around about, say, 350 years before Christ. But he was the last of the prophets. He's a minor prophet simply because he's called a minor prophet because his prophecy is small. A major prophet, you've written a much longer prophet prophecy. But he, so he wrote particular at a period of history that is somewhere situated right in between Nehemiah chapter 12 and Nehemiah 13. Up to Nehemiah 12, we have Nehemiah back in the land doing his work. He goes back to see Artaxerxes. Then when he comes back again, Malachi, uh, Nehemiah 13 is written. It's when he's returned to the land. So we, you'll probably recall that Nehemiah record, returned to the court of Persia at the end of 12 years. He was given 12 years to go and do the work he had to do. He served 12 years as the governor of Judea. Now, that's in Nehemiah 5 Verse 14, it says that he returned to the court in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes and he then ultimately went back again to Jerusalem. So something, his work was done. So something made him return. You know, he had been in Jerusalem for a period of 12 years. He had achieved the work that he, he was given to do there that, in rehabilitating the people and, and reinvigorating that people and that ecclesia with a zeal for the truth. He got them on fire as it was once again in their service to God and at the end of that agreed time that he agreed with the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, he returned to his duties in the court of the king of Persia. And so far as Nehemiah was concerned at that particular moment, his work was completed. Now the only thing that could have brought Nehemiah back to Jerusalem then was the call of Malachi. So after Nehemiah had actually left Jerusalem, went back to Persia, the truth, as soon as he left, the truth began to deteriorate very, very quickly. The enemies who Nehemiah had opposed and he had, had subdued 
came to the forefront once again very quickly and they reasserted themselves in that, amongst those people and in that ecclesia. And they corrupted not only themselves, but they corrupted the people also. Therefore, the work which Nehemiah had accomplished in that 12 years there began to go down the drain, as it were, very quickly, and things weren't looking very good in the Jerusalem and in, particularly in the Ecclesia. So then we have this warning that Malachi gives in chapter 3 and verse 1. He says to the people there in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now the word Lord there is not the divine name, it's simply the word Adon, and it means a Lord or a ruler. So it's not speaking of Yahweh himself. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, I believe, had a primary fulfilment in the return of Nehemiah to Jerusalem. Now, we know, of course, that it typifies also the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the ultimate fulfilment of that verse. But Nehemiah himself was a type of Christ, and so therefore Malachi sets about giving that warning to the people. He says to them, in essence, if you do not restore your ways to that which Nehemiah had established in Jerusalem, if you don't get back to the faithful attitude that you should exhibit, then what's going to happen is this, he said. The Lord whom you seek, and by the way, that's said with a certain amount of um, irony because the, they certainly weren't seeking anyone, him at all, the Lord at all, any more than Israel today is seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a certain amount of irony in it. But they said that he said, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did when he returned. Nehemiah, we find that when he returned, he went immediately back, he went to Jerusalem, he immediately went to the temple and he cleaned it out of the apostates and he restored the nation and that ecclesia to a proper form of worship before God, exactly as will be done in the near future by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this man, Malachi, is a man was a man of great courage. And he comes in this personage of my messenger. He was Yahweh's messenger to the nation, warning them of the circumstances under which they were living and, and, and undermining of all that had been rehabilitated by Nehemiah. So Malachi was a man who stepped up and vigorously attacked the religious authorities of his day and also the apathy of the people. And Malachi takes the stand in this very difficult period of time when the truth was deteriorating so very rapidly and when there was this need for a voice to emerge and stand up and faithfully and courageously before the people, he had to stand up that they might learn once again and have set before them the principles of divine truth so that they might be restored to God's way. Now, as we've already said, there's many interesting parables, uh, parallels and similarities between Nehemiah and Malachi. Now, these things are all written in Malachi and Nehemiah for us to read. For example, we have... We find a question of marriage to alien wives mentioned in Malachi chapter 2 and it's dealt with also in Nehemiah 13 verse 23. We have the question that he puts to them of, of the withholding of the tithes from the Levites which Malachi condemns in chapter 3 verse 8 and Nehemiah does likewise in chapter 13 verse 10. We have the question that he puts to them of the neglect and the dishonour associated with the temple services, the neglect and dishonour associated with temple service, services which Malachi condemns in chapter 1 at verses 12 and 13 and Nehemiah deals with in chapter 13 verses 4, 5 and 11. And fourthly, we have the repudiation and the casting off of the legitimate wives of the men of Israel in Malachi 2 verses 14 to 16 and Nehemiah deals with that very eloquently and very clearly in chapter 13 Verse 23 and 27. So after Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem, he finds the circumstances 
exactly as they're set out for us in the book of Malachi. Exactly. So we have this remarkable parallel between these two books. Now, Malachi tells us that temple worship had been restored, but yet there was this ceremonial formalism and a kind of almost unbelievable unbelievable hypocrisy that had really invalidated the worship of Israel. Because, as we know, God will not be worshipped half-heartedly, or we should know. He will not be worshipped as men might like to worship him, such as we find with the example of Cain. You know, Cain was quite happy to be a worshipper of God, but on his own terms. So in the days of Malachi, he draws attention to the fact that true religious zeal had declined in the hearts of the people. You know, and a remarkable thing is that personal holiness within individuals had degenerated to a point where it's no longer considered necessary for an Israelite to manifest a godly way of life. It's unbelievable, really. But in the book of Malachi, you notice that throughout every verse, virtually, there is some kind of a reference to the widespread apathy that was just absolutely sapping the morality and the spirituality out of the people. They were immersed in this attitude of apathy. You know, when we're not studying the word as individuals, when we haven't got our heads in the word of God, as individuals or as an ecclesia, we become quite easy and docile, quite easy to manage. When we're not immersing our things in the mind of God, you know, when we're not really interested in the word of God, well, an ecclesia of that calibre, of that nature, is very happy to have a group of apathetic brethren because they're easy to look after. They don't go around the ecclesia asking awkward questions. They don't go around querying and asking, why did you say that? Or why do you do that in a particular way? Or why is this done in the ecclesia? And why is that done in the ecclesia when the Bible says it should be thus, thus and thus? So... That ecclesia in those days, they didn't have problems like that. So after Nehemiah left the city, no problems in the ecclesia because apathy just took over. Anything went. So the people of Israel had grown extremely worldly. They had grown very, very careless in spiritual matters. And you know, carelessness is something which will eventually lead to outright apostasy. Brother Rogers said several times in his study on Hannah, corrupt doctrine will lead to corrupt practice. Malachi's study, book is, and prophecy is the proof of that. Carelessness in handling the things of God in a way that results from, real, from a lack of any really deep love for the truth. Now, we all remember the Lord's Christ's controversy with the ecclesia at Ephesus in the first of the seven letters he, to the seven ecclesias he said to Ephesus thou has left thy first love why? because there was apathy in the ecclesia at Ephesus there was a, a degree of carelessness in handling the word of God and the things of God and eventually that ecclesia become totally and utterly apostate you know the Lord's warning that I will spew thee out of my mouth which was a general warning as far as ecclesias were concerned, came to pass. Then the ecclesias in Asia eventually evolved into the Roman Catholic apostate system, which was due solely to carelessness and apathy. And when those things, carelessness and apathy, are apparent within any ecclesial generation, no matter when it is, there will be a lack of real reverence for the things of God. There will be a lack of love for the things of God. And we all know that the things that we love, the things that we cherish and the things that we really love, we care for. And to care for something is just the very opposite of being careless. So we find that the forthright message of Malachi is strongly, very strongly conservative in every aspect of what he has to write. Because... Now, he's taking his people back to some of the basic elements of their law, which was the foundation upon which that nation was established. 
He, he takes them back to the past. He's taking them back to a proper, proper understanding of God with particular reference to the writings in Deuteronomy. You know, the writings of Deuteronomy are referred to again and again and again throughout the book of Malachi, as so are some writings in Leviticus. And, and there, so what he's saying to these people, to this nation, to this ecclesia is get back to your original foundations. Cast off the apathy and the careless and the indifference and worship God in the spirit of truth. So throughout the book of Malachi, we find that certain things constantly are reiterated for us. Firstly, there is a God in Israel. He has got a love for Israel despite what you might think to the contrary. He was their father. He was their master as revealed in the law. He is a holy God, and therefore, because he's a holy God, he expects holiness in his people. And his ageless doctrines, principles, and precepts, and the instructions that he had given for the behavior of the priesthood are set forth again and again and again. You know, and there's references here in Malachi to, to the day of judgment, when all will be called into account. There are also references to the hope of Israel, revealing, of course, that as a nation... They will eventually be established in their kingdom at the manifestation of the one like unto Moses. And that's what this people, this ecclesia should have had. They should have had that in mind. They should have been casting off this apathy and this carelessness which is dominating their attitude towards religious worship. Now had they had a vision of the future and had they had a vision of the coming of the Messiah and had they actually been fired with a zeal and an some enthusiasm, then of course things would have been very, very different indeed. Now, one of the most powerful and impressive features of Malachi's writing, now, before I came to the truth, I wasn't interested in the truth, but I went off with my wife to an ecclesial camp, and the studies that weekend happened to be on Malachi. I changed from having absolutely no interest in the truth because I was so impressed with the power and the impressive features of Malachi. I came home from that weekend and I went to a brother and said, look, I have to do something about the truth. And one of the, the most powerful and impressive features of this writings of Malachi is that he was not prepared to adapt the principles of the truth to the particular circumstances in which he found himself. He was not prepared at any time to say, well, look, Nehemiah's gone. This conservative hand has been withdrawn. And now I realise that things are a little different in the world and, and th so things are different and, and we, we have a bit of a more general, liberal attitude toward the things of the truth and we can afford perhaps to take certain liberties that maybe Nehemiah might not have allowed and we can afford to have a more relaxed attitude because after all it's nice to be la relaxed about the things of the truth, nice to be relaxed in life and things in general. Well, Malachi was not prepared to do that, and we find that in every verse of this book that to Malachi, the truth was the truth. The truth was the truth in the days of Moses through to Malachi. The truth was the truth as Nehemiah had brought it forth and re-established it in that nation. And the same was still the truth in the times of Malachi. And the truth is the truth today. And the message that permeates every verse of his book is that the truth is something that is unalterable. That principles of the truth cannot be bent and they cannot be interpreted to suit the requirements of a moment of the moment, whatever that moment may be. There's five basic messages given in this book to this particular ecclesia at that time, but all ecclesias that follow on after. They are reminded in chapter one that they have become an unholy nation. They are reminded that they now have a faithless priesthood. Therefore, by obvious progression of degeneration, they've become a godless people. They've also become a nation of robbers upon whom the judgment of God will come. And when they term this nation of robbers, the one whom they have robbed is God himself. And then finally, we have this message at the end of chapter 3 to the end of the book that there was a faithful remnant in that 
ecclesia that will be vindicated. But in addition to these five messages that are given to this people, we find that he charges them with a threefold guilt. He says to them that they're charged with the guilt of ignorance. They had forgotten things from the the word that they should have been thoroughly acquainted with. Now, if you just pause for a moment and think about that, they'd forgotten things that they'd learnt earlier. You know, how, how can it be that this generation that he's speaking to were now in a state of ignorance? Well, it can only be that they'd admitted the instructions of the law, which required that, that elders, that um, people in the ecclesia, that, and parents should pass on from generation to generation. Things had obviously been lax in the generation that had gone before, so they, they had not been brought up and educated, those in the ecclesia who needed that help and their children properly in the things of the truth. Secondly, they're charged with the sin of indifference. In other words, the word of God no longer fired them up. They were not filled with a zeal for the things of God and the things of the truth. And the third great sin they're charged with is the sin of self-seeking. They were seeking their own interests before the interests of God. Now, God gives every one of us, every man is given a responsibility to provide for the needs of his family in various ways. But those needs are much more than material things. The most dominant amongst those needs is the spiritual education of one's family. But to do that, the spiritual education of oneself has to come first because how can any father or any husband or any brother or any elder in the, in the ecclesia educate his family or his extended family if he's ignorant of the truth itself and all the details? You know, these people were not following the ways of God. They were so dominated by the affairs of this life that that had become their life. And the things of God were just a very, very indifferent aspect of their daily living. So hence we have this carelessness, hence the growth of apathy, and hence the growth of indifference in this ecclesia, that ecclesia at that time. Now, when we open the book of Malachi, so there's some introduction to the book and, and where we're heading with these studies, but when we open the book of Malachi, we find that the book really begins... In verse 2, with the words, and remember, Malachi is merely the mouthpiece for Yahweh. He's the messenger. He's, it's Yahweh speaking to this nation. He says in verse 2 of Malachi chapter 1, he says, I have loved you. Now, it's very interesting the way that this book opens because it begins actually really abruptly in verse 1. There's no formal introduction beyond the words, the burden of the word of Yahweh to Israel by Malachi. That's the total introduction to the book, just one sentence and just a few words at that. But then the message of the book proper begins with the words, I have loved you. You know, God would do anything and everything to draw that nation, that ecclesia to him again upon the proper terms and the proper basis. Now, although the book begins with the words, I have loved you, we then find when we go to the last words of the book, in chapter 4 and at verse 6, that the last words in the book are a curse. So we need to be impressed with this fact that God offers to extend his love to his people, unconditionally, really, so that, but they should be soberly, uh, that they should soberly understand that from chapter 4 and verse 6, that rejection of his love will end up for them in a curse. Now, God didn't want that to happen. And therefore, he caused to be raised up this prophet by the name of Malachi so that he might direct the God's people back to the way of the truth. So, with all those things in mind then, as we've gone through them, is it any wonder that we find the theme of this book is who may abide the day of his coming in chapter 3 verse 2 who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth now the whole purpose of that theme 
is just as relevant, if not more relevant today, as it ever was in the day that it was written. We, we, brothers and sisters, need to ask ourselves virtually every day of our lives, we should be asking ourselves every day, who may abide the day of his coming and who may stand at his appearing? And in asking that question, we have to be, we must, must be preparing ourselves so that we can abide, that we may abide and we may be able to stand in the day of the Lord's coming. To stand before him acceptably. You know, this theme, who may abide the day of his coming, that, that, when you think about it, that just conjures up just so much for us about the truth itself. And that for us, if that, that's not the way we're thinking already, that has to start today. Can't start tomorrow or next week or next month. That may be too late. Christ may have returned. It has to start right now. You know, we have to ask ourselves right now, who may abide the day of his coming? And the answer to that it's pretty obvious, really, isn't it? It's the one who is prepared. It's the, it's, it's the one who's developed their spiritual mind to the point that they have an empathy with God and with his Son, who has, has developed their lives as designed by God and his word, that they might be prepared in their hearts and in their minds, in their attitude of separation from the world and their dedication to God so that they might be prepared for the very soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this very theme of Malachi, who may abide the day of his coming, is a theme then which actually very much relates to preparation. We all must be preparing constantly. It relates actually to a life dedicated to the God of Israel, that we might know him and, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And we were reminded in John 17 verse 3 that our lives might be dedicated wholly to the hope of Israel. Wholly in its totality. Those who are called to the truth by the great mercy of our God, if they resolve within themselves to become living and energetic and active in the truth, then they will abide the day of his coming. There's no doubt of that. Now, so in verse 1 then of Malachi, we have this very, very brief introduction. The burden of the word of Yahweh. Now the word burden actually means oracle. It's in Rotherham's and Jesenius. Burden is the word oracle. So in that sense we have Malachi appointed or to bear or to carry this mission, this message to that ecclesia, to that nation at that time, the people at that time. So it's an oracle, which really an oracle really means a prophecy or a revelation. So what we have here is the revelation of the word of Yahweh. And if you have a look in your margin, you'll see it's by the hand of Malachi. The revelation of the word of Yahweh by the hand of Malachi. So the opening words of the book really are in verse 2. I have loved you. Now, with those opening words, the prophet is really laying down a thesis, a foundation, which he then he, he proceeds to press repeatedly through his book, presenting an absolutely unanswerable argument. You know, brothers and sisters, there are things recorded in Malachi which have been, would have been very, very hard for the people in his day to take on board. And I'd suggest that there's things in Malachi it will be very hard for some of us, if not all of us, to take on board ourselves. But I'd also suggest that there are things in the book of Malachi that should absolutely make us humble ourselves before God so we can submit to those things. And yet, you know, the purpose of all this was to show God's love for his people. And to me, that's an absolutely wonderful thing, that even when our God rebukes us, even when he chastens us, even when he addresses to us burning words of condemnation, it's not so he can sit back and enjoy his own perfection or, or watch us squirm, as it were, under the imperfections of our own nature and what that nature produces, not by any means. It is done because God loves us. After all, you know, we all, those of us who have children, we know that we show our love in that way to our children. We chastise them at times when they need it and 
for that, our children learn from those things. And it's because of that that God says to them, I have loved you. And he's given proof after proof after proof throughout the history of that nation. So what do we find then? Verse 2, we find he says to them, I have loved you. And what do they do? They come straight back and say, we're in. Hast thou loved us? You know, it's almost unbelievable to think that they could address God in that way. But they come straight back, where? And has thou loved us? They questioned God and they said, well, if you've loved us, where's the proof of your love? Prove it. Which just totally reiterates that they hadn't remembered the things of old. They hadn't bothered. They'd been careless. Apathy had set in. You know, they haven't, hadn't remembered over their time the way that God had showed his love for them. And just like a, a forgetful child, like a child when we, we, those who have had children will have known that sometime or other you've chastised your child, they go off, they go into their bedroom, they sit on the bed and they sit there and say, my father doesn't love me anymore because you've chastised them. It's as though there's some kind of proof to that effect merely because they mouth the words. That's what that nation was doing. Their problem was that they had insufficient depth of spiritual understanding and therefore they failed to recognise that all their present troubles and all their problems were entirely of their own making. They could not recognise the love of God. You know, if we ever reach a stage like that, whether as individuals or in ecclesia, then we're in a great deal of trouble. And we need to return very, very quickly with all humility and all submission to the God that we claim to worship. You know, when we forget about the love of God, when we look at our lives and the truth, and especially when we are under some trial, we may be moved to say, you know, well, why isn't God doing something to help me? It's almost the same as saying, we're in, hast thou loved us? And ignoring the fact that if, if God is allowing trial to come upon us, it's invariably because it is the chastening of Yahweh and because he loves us. And we need that particular chastening at that time. So the question is asked here, they, they say to God, wherein has thou loved us? So God answers that with a question of his own. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Well, the whole purpose of Yahweh's question there was to remind Israel that Jacob had been treated differently to Esau. And in actual fact, it becomes a really a classic case for Malachi to quote, because we know that Esau was the elder. And if either of those two brothers should have got any special privileges from God, by the law of, of nature, it should have been Esau. But God chose Jacob. And he goes on in that verse to say, I love Jacob. Now, Brothers and sisters, that there is a, is a reference for us to the principle of divine selection. And that's something we should never, ever forget. Because every one of us, every one of us who has been baptised into Christ, regardless of what our situation in life was before we were baptised, every one of us that has been baptised into Christ have been divinely selected for a part in the purpose of God no, and if that doesn't, will not teach us humble submission to God, then really I don't know of anything else that will. So God says here, I've loved Jacob, yet I hated Esau, he says in verse 3. Now the word hate is actually rather, really a, a very strong expression and it's, it's not really meant as we understand the word today. It's a Hebraism, it's a Hebrew expression. You know, in every language there are certain kinds of terminologies that are used. And, and the Hebrew language, which is probably the most poetic and the most expressive of all languages the world has ever known, one of the aspects of, of, of a Hebraism is to express an extreme by mentioning another extreme. So the idea of saying, I hated Esau, is not so much to emphasise his hatred as far as Esau was concerned, but rather to emphasise the extent of the love that God had for Jacob. So God reminds them that as, as far as Edom was concerned, their heritage was laid waste, they were treated to the judgments of God, which incidentally they so richly deserved. In, in verses 3 and 4 of Malachi chapter 1 it says, 
I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith Yahweh Sabaoth, They shall build, but I will throw down. Now in the use of that name and that title, the name of Yahweh and the title Sabaoth, we have the militant title of the deity. Whenever God wants to represent himself in a belligerent manner against his enemies or in a militant manner, that's the title that is used, Yahweh Sabaoth. And we probably all know that means he who will be armies. So therefore, it represents God and his angelic beings going forth manifested in that way, in a, in a militant manner. And this phrase, Yahweh Sabaoth, occurs no less than 24 times in the book of Malachi. And that's done to remind us that Israel will one day know the fire of his judgment together with his love rekindled. It's to remind us that the time is coming, as it says in chapter 3 and verse 9, it says there, when the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. This time in the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ, Though when that time comes, the whole earth will know the outpouring of divine judgment before peace is established upon the earth. Now we should always remember that the God with whom we actually deal is a God of judgment. And that doesn't necessarily mean a God of of condemnatory judgment. But at, at the judgment seat of Christ, he will judge some as being worthy of the kingdom and he will judge some as being unworthy of the kingdom. So as far as the apostate nations of the world are concerned, they will always see the judgments of God. So God says there to these people in in chapter 1 at verse 5, he says to them, that the time is coming, in verse 5, when your eyes, so these are the people's eyes themselves, when your eyes shall see and ye shall say, Yahweh will be magnified from the border of Israel. So right at the beginning of his book, Despite the matters that he has taken up with them, their long-term destiny is laid out for them. He says, your eyes shall see. Your eyes shall see. The eyes of the Israelites will see the fulfilment of the truth of the prophet's words. God is saying in effect to them, you will see in the proof of all the things that God is going to do in the future, the proof of God's love for his people Israel. And we know that's true, don't we? In the judgments that are going to come upon the nations at the return of Christ, or or where the judgments are going to be severe and the nations are going to be humbled at the severity of God's judgment, we know what's going to come out of it. We know that there's going to be peace. Out of this judgment there will come peace upon all nations of the earth. We will see the fulfilment of the Abrahamic covenant. In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. But what of Israel? Well, we will see the regathering of the nation of Israel, the regathering of the 12 tribes, their enlightenment, their education, their resettlement in the land of their fathers. With Jesus Christ as their king and Messiah, 12 apostles sitting each on a throne, judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. So he says to them there in verse 5, your eyes shall see. And then he says, ye shall say, Yahweh will be magnified from the border of Israel. And when he says here that ye shall say, it's quite different, isn't it, to what we read in verse 2, where ye ye say, they they were saying to God, ye ye say, where and hast thou loved us? Well, they're going to find out in that day, depicted here in verse 5, says your eye, God says to them, your eyes will see, and then you will say, and that reminds us that the time's coming when Israel will have a new heart when their heart of stone will be replaced with a heart of flesh, and they're going to become an enlightened people. A new heart will be formed in Israel, and they will acknowledge the power of Yahweh Sabaoth, he who will be armies. They will once and for all, at that time, destroy the principles of anti-Semitism that we see throughout the world. They will once and for all destroy the power of the Gentiles who try to dominate the people of Israel, the Jewish nation. So they will see 
And then they will be moved to say, as we see in verse 5, that God will be magnified from the border of Israel. And in other versions, that's rendered as beyond, around the world, beyond the borders of Israel. But the Jews of Malachi's day, they never, ever look for that happening. But God is saying that in the future generations, that is what's going to happen. So here's a question, brothers and sisters, of the Jews bit of a long-winded question, but we'll get to it. Of the Jews to whom Malachi addressed his message, of that generation who had turned their backs upon the love and the kindness of the sacrifice of Nehemiah, who had given himself fully and totally to restore that people to divine, to divine worship and to rekindle their zeal for the love of God and for the truth, of these people to whom Malachi speaks... They have now become engulfed in apathy and, and indifference and a careless attitude towards their God. Here's the question. How many of them will be there to see God glorified beyond the borders of Israel? How many of them will be there to see those things and to be resurrected to glory and an eternal inheritance in the kingdom? Well, the answer's simple, isn't it? Not very many at all. Not many. But we, there will be some. Malachi tells us that. We find that in chapter 3 and at verse 16. He says, in chapter 3 and at verse 16, he says, Then them that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and thought upon his name. There was a faithful remnant there. It wasn't as though everyone had turned against Nehemiah and everyone had turned against Malachi. There were brothers and sisters there who loved the truth, who clung to what they believed, and nobody was going to take it from them. Nobody was going to rob them of the day of Messiah's return and the establishment of the kingdom, even though it may be many, many generations away. Their faith was sound. Their faith was secure. So Malachi tells us that those that feared Yahweh spake often one to another. You know, that's probably one of the better known verses amongst Christadelphians from the book of Malachi. Then they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another, and Yahweh hearkened and heard. Now, why is it that they spake often just one to another? Why didn't they go out and speak to everybody else in the land? Well, the answer is the others just didn't want to hear what they had to say. So therefore, they developed a class of people within the ecclesia at that time in the days of Malachi whose only companionship was with one another because, sadly, they were despised by the rest of the nation. And it says here, they that feared God spoke often one to another. They spoke to one another because they were of one mind, they had one purpose, they had one love, and they had one faith that united them. And that's what we have to do. Talk amongst ourselves of the things that we believe. Talk about our faith one to another. Talk about what the truth actually means to us. So time's sort of up tonight. What we've endeavoured to do tonight and just this first study is just really to paint a picture of the background of this book. Some of the great issues that confronted the prophet Malachi and the times in which he lived. You know, Malachi saw an absolute urgent need for leadership to be brought back into that nation and to that ecclesia at that time. Hence the warning in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And it took the return of Nehemiah to rectify the procedures in that nation and among that ecclesia. But in the meantime, there remained a people who were faithful to the things of God and who feared or who reverenced the God of Israel, and who spoke of him one to another in every generation. And the thing that we really need to bear in mind, something we must always remember, as it says here, when we do that, Yahweh hearkened, and he heard it. Yahweh will never close his ear. He will never turn away from those whom he has called to his truth, who remain steadfast and faithful in their service and dedication to him. And he will bring them through all the trials of life and he ultimately will bring them into the kingdom itself.